And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from, coming to us straight from Farwood, Pu Farwood Publishing creator of the upcoming campaigns, campaign setting and adventure Wayfarers of the Far Wood, the one, the one and only Andreas Mikkelsen. How are you doing today, man? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's all good here in Sweden, Stockholm. Mm -hmm. well, I'd be... I'd be lying if I if I said you're the if I said you're the first get the first guy from Sweden I've had in the temple. <laughs> yeah, well, we are uh, you know always looking towards America <laughs> with our uh, creations here. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'd like to I'd like to open with the humble beginnings as I often do. So. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, so uh, my first introduction is probably from when I was uh, uh, no more than perhaps uh, seven or eight, uh, and I was up at uh, our uh, uh, house up in the northern parts of Sweden, uh, mm -hmm. where I think that my perhaps uncle or something had a... Uh, Mutant Chronicles uh, game lay lying around, and uh, that was perhaps you know the first introduction to something that wasn't just regular Euro games or something. That was an introduction to something. Do these kind of kind of games even exist? That you know it blew my mind that uh, you could make games like that, and uh, that also started to like pique my interest. So whenever we were in bookstores or you know uh, going at the two. Uh, uh, small, uh, you know, uh, uh, shops uh, that sell games and stuff. I was always looking at, you know, back in the shelves where no one was uh, looking, and I found, you know, these weird Dungeons and Dragons books or even the Swedish variants uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, haven't uh, perhaps been introduced to America. But uh, uh, and started to, you know, page and look through them. Uh, the big problem was that uh, there wasn't many kids around in perhaps the uh, 90s uh, in Sweden that was uh, very, you know, into role-playing games. It's not like in America where it was a big craze from the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there wasn't many to play with. So I had like these books and stuff that I looked through and really wanted to play, but uh, yeah, pretty much never dared to ask anyone. Uh, so time went by and I came in, you know, I started, uh, there was a lot of other cool cu nerd culture to uh, consume. So, uh, yeah, I read all the books, the regular books and, you know, more books and <laughs> uh, started to learn about Dungeons and Dragons anyway, just because of the internet and that there were people, you know, in other places of the world uh, playing it. But then eventually, for like uh, seven years ago, a friend of mine uh, from out of nowhere asked me, uh, shouldn't we, you know, in our group, start playing Dungeons and & Dragons? And by then I had pretty much dropped, you know, the uh, thought of ever starting playing. <laughs> so I was, of course, uh, I jumped in, dove in completely. Mm -hmm. I became the Dungeon Master and started building, you know, uh, my own worlds. Uh, I definitely took, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, I... I uh, Perhaps uh, did the naive mistake of uh, deciding to uh, play uh, from the start in my own world completely, uh, which is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a lot for a new dungeon master to be able to create content, a new world, uh, settings, and learn about the rules at the same time. But mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you learn a lot as well. So uh, that's uh, the real interest started, you could say. And also, uh, from that uh, start, uh, I started, uh, I found love for writing, really, mm -hmm. uh, through that. Uh, so, uh, th that, have, that became a, a thing that I just started doing uh, 
on evenings when after work I could sit just and write stories. Uh, and I found that uh, uh, I just wrote for you know the passion of, passion of writing. Uh, so eventually uh, enough content gathered up, and I also am a sucker for complex systems and you know uh, making rules and uh, yeah creating classes and you name it. Uh, so enough content started building up that I felt like hmm, I could perhaps create something from this. Uh, and all of this, uh, most of the content uh, was based around an idea that I had early on, uh, really, which mm-hmm. grew into uh, grew into this book eventually, Wayfarers of the Far Wood. Yeah, I could say. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um, Wayfarers, was this an, was this an idea born from your born from, born from your own campaigns, or did it have a different origin story? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, so it's uh, the the big origin is uh, that I had an idea while playing early on that hmm, it's a bit uh, sometimes it can be a bit boring or uh, seen as a hassle to travel from point A to point B in a uh, in a campaign, mm-hmm. especially early on before you you know can teleport or something. Uh, so, and most of the campaigns that we played uh, had very sparse, you know, rule sets about traveling. And usually it's like you get a table with some random events and you can roll and you see, okay, this happens sometime during the day. Uh, but that was, was pretty much it. So I thought, hmm, perhaps I could create a system that's more uh, intricate and uh, gives you more interesting, you know, choices as a player. Uh, to affect your uh, travels forward, uh, all but the, uh, so that was the main idea, really, and it came out of us playing, you could say. Uh, but it's not really based in one campaign or one instance of a game, really. But it's more of uh, you know, from experience, you could say. Uh, so uh, that's where it all started, really. Mm-hmm. And. With that, with that kind of thing in mind, so with um, Wayfarers, it's vi- obviously there's been a, there's a lot of fan- there's a lot of um, interpretations that when it comes to um, fantasy, but if I, am I would I be correct in assuming that Wayfarers is going for far more of a primal feel, especially since it do- since from where I'm looking at it doesn't seem that. Um, that humans are going to be the default within this kind of setting. Uh, you're uh, correct that it's uh, definitely a lot more of a primal feel. Uh, I would call it a primordial world. Uh, that uh, the world of Lorsun, which is uh, uh, where Wayfarers of the Farwood takes place. Uh, so it's uh, a world where uh, most of the plane, or if you call it that, or the world, is uh, covered by a uh, huge forest, a huge wilderness. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this wilderness is an uh, ever-changing landscape. So this world is infused with uh, currents of raw uh, magic energy that, uh, you know, flows through the plane. And uh, these uh, raw magics uh, transform the land at uh, random intervals. So uh, there are large uh, chaotic waves of energy called pterodanches that uh, you know, sweep across this wilderness and transform it from one type of terrain to another. Uh, so this is the challenge that the players have to overcome, really, is to travel across this wilderness as wayfarers. They are tasked uh, uh, to connect the isolated bastions of civilization that exist in this world. So. Mm-hmm. There might be, uh, due to this ever-changing uh, wilderness, there are no roads really to follow. Uh, you have to navigate by, well, the stars, by certain uh, parts of the landscape that stand firm against these terrorlanches, such as mountains, and uh, there are also certain magical places that uh, are uh, fixtures in this uh, world map, you could say. Uh, so it's a, it's a, a, a big... Uh, the big thing for players is that they get to plan their journey. So they start at some settlement somewhere and they get uh, perhaps a mission to go to another settlement, perhaps bringing uh, packages or people or uh, whatever. And 
uh, they have to plan their whole journey and uh, prepare so that they yeah, survive through the wilderness, you could say. And mm -hmm. these wayfarers are, of course, specialized in, uh, no in all the knowledge that you need to survive in the far wood. That's the name of the big wilderness. Yeah. Uh, um, what ins what inspired you to focus on w to focus on wilderness as the as the major theme with um, wayfarers? Uh, so it's uh, really based on this idea that the journey matters. That's the the idea that I had from the beginning that I want to create a travel system, uh, and uh, what better way to uh, use a travel system than to have a. Uh, a world where the travel becomes, uh, you know, something new every time that you travel uh, through it. Uh, so, you know, one thought led to another, you know, that uh, I wanted a world where the ramp, the terrain almost uh, changed uh, through every time that each time you travel from one place to another, even though you went the same way, you would experience new things each time. Uh, so uh, this uh, led to, okay, what kind of world could facilitate this mechanic, really? Uh, and I started thinking that perhaps it could be a really primordial place uh, where uh, magic is very raw and very, you know, uh, almost uh, unreliable or, <laughs> you know, un, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's uh, uh, hard to manage, you know, it can explode a spell can explode if you try to cast it or uh, due to the like uh, 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 the very raw magic that is infused in the world uh, so that's uh, that's where that uh, thought came from really if you use perhaps a steampunk world or something it's so easy for people to uh, you know create then you almost expect there to be a flying ship of some sort or if you use a too medieval fantasy setting, then of, then it could be that you expect people to be able to teleport easily or uh, be able to use um, other magics that bring you from you know point A to point B. So I wanted mm -hmm. to uh, create a world where that really didn't exist as much. I could say. Yeah, I, c I can certainly get I can certainly get that. And um, since you mentioned the journey being important, I'm cu I'm curious what you think about. Um, hex crawl types of play. I love them. <laughs> so, and that's uh, a big inspiration, you know, a lot of uh, these uh, hex crawl, uh, what do you say, settings that exist. Uh, so, I wanted to create something that uh, had a little bit of a feeling like that. Uh, so, uh, I, I love the thought of, you know, uh, finding something new on each part of the map that you explore. And, uh, you know, uh, so that's uh, I think that's a, a very cool uh, idea. Uh, mm -hmm. So something that I'm uh, much in love with. <laughs> and now, when it now when it comes to the, when it comes to its um it's set it's set up as a, as a book. Um, would it be fair to me to say that th that this is a that that the primary thing that people are going to see when they look into this is the campaign setting, and then late, and then later on in the book, the um, adventure going from level one through ten. Uh, yeah, so the book is divided into three parts, really. Uh, the main hardcover book, uh, and each part is available then as a, a digital PDF as well. Uh, so. Uh, but the main uh, book, uh, the three parts, uh, begins with uh, the world of Lorsun uh, uh, campaign setting, as you said, uh, which is, uh, you know, describes the world in general, how people live there, what the player characters will be, uh, you know, usually work with and do, uh, work as wayfarers, and how that, you know, system works. Uh, also, uh, it contains a very large portion, which is about the travel, uh, the level-based traveling system that I've created, which is this whole system for travel. Uh, so that uh, that system is uh, really a process that the dungeon master can use to uh, randomize terrain uh, mm -hmm. during uh, the wayfarer's travels, and from the randomized terrain, they get uh, encounters based on the Wayfarer's level uh, and also uh, based on a score that is called the danger rating. 
so the danger rating might go up or down during uh, the wayfarer's travels, depending on how well they uh, navigate the farwood. Uh, so if you uh, navigate, uh, uh, if you need to perhaps uh, hasten your travels forward, you might navigate in a worse way, it might become tougher. Uh, and you might, uh, you know, increase your danger rating, which might increase the uh, risk of bumping into a more dangerous encounter of some sort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, when it when it comes to the when it comes to the method of um of cha of changing the of changing the um, terrain, I'm get I'm guessing it's a I'm guessing it's a it's a chart based affair, and. If so, if so, how much of how much of a factor of where the of where the players go will um will af will affect it? Because what I'm curious about is what is um how how complete how full random it is 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 it a case is it a case where one might be seeing planes one day and then all of a sudden in the next hex for lack of a better term they end up in the middle of a, of a swamp. Uh, well, it's uh, pretty much like that. There is a different uh, uh, different uh, chances of different terrains happening. Uh, so some terrains are more rare than others. Uh, the most common terrain is a you know forest type terrain or a jungle, you could say almost. Mm -hmm. uh, while other terrains uh, are much more rare and some are quite more common. So like a swamp would be quite common. Uh, so the uh, mechanics and the like lore behind it is more or less that at some point a terralanche has swept through, you know, the part that the uh, wayfaring company, as they call it, uh, the wayfarers, are uh, the part of the world that they are traveling through. So uh, they might be traveling one day through a, a piece of uh, forest and then come upon, during their travels, a uh, swamp which might, you know, continue forward for uh, several days or just one day, you know, uh, depending on the size of it. And mm -hmm. that uh, is and that is decided on roles by the DM, really. And I've given the DM uh, the choice if they want to, you know, prepare ahead exactly how the uh, terrain should be, if they're more like, okay, I want to know what they're going to travel through so I can describe it in an easy manner and also... Uh, you know, have some knowledge of what might happen. Or they can go for, you know, the full experience where uh, it's random even to them exactly what terrain will, uh, the wayfarers will be going into the next day. Uh, so, uh, I just roll and see. Uh, and the, during a day's travel, one of these terralanche events might happen as well. So, uh, that the terralanches are also encounters, you could say. So there are uh, really uh, five different types of encounters, you could say, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, uh, where one type is uh, what I call an obstacle, and an obstacle might be that it's just you know you're traveling forward and it's uh, uh, the vegetation is so thick that you have to roll a bunch of you know different. Uh, 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 ability checks to get through it, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, get exhaustion points and similar uh, things happen. Uh, or it can be that a terralanche uh, actually uh, hits the wayfaring company, and then uh, if a terralanche happens, uh, a bunch of wild things can happen. That the uh, there is a table uh, that comes with a book uh, that the DM can you know roll if they want to, or they can simply uh, decide themselves how to you know. Uh, explain what's happening. Uh, the Wayfarers has also uh, possibilities of uh, warding off terralanches in different manners, but that's more, you know, connected to classes and a little bit like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, so, when it comes to the terrain, it might be, you know, that it's uh, a terralanche doesn't happen at all while they're traveling forward, and uh, they get to go through perhaps uh, a few days of forest, and then it's a swamp, and then it's forest again, and then it's, uh, you know, they're at their destination. Uh, or it could be a really, you know, if they're unlucky, it can be like changing for every day that they're traveling forward. Uh, 
and that might make things more uh, you know rough on the journey depending on what type of uh, journey uh, what type of things that you're carrying with you or uh, if uh, yeah what you expect to uh, to see during your journeys what you have prepared for mm -hmm. I could say now when it now um when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to when it comes to the danger rating, um, how similar or how different would that be from something like in something like um, challenge level that that's been pre that's been present in fifth edition? Uh, so it's uh, I see it as a supplement to really you know the uh, challenge rating that you can see on a uh, monster or something or in a specific encounter. Uh, so what I use the danger rating for is really just I want another way to uh, say uh, I want a, a score system to say that okay uh, if you have this danger rating and you're at this level uh, you should get you know this sort of uh, encounter to keep it interesting uh, but you're going to get uh, your danger rating is plus two at the moment so your encounter is going to be two uh, you know, steps higher uh, in danger. Uh, that might uh, sometimes lead to, you know, a, a encounter, if you have a battle encounter, that's, uh, you know, more deadly and more uh, dangerous in every way, and you might have to flee or something. But it can also be that you find uh, really special encounters that you wouldn't else uh, find at your level that can give you uh, things that, yeah, you know, are uh, considered perhaps uh, something that, in a regular campaign, we would consider uh, that you get something overpowered too early or something. Mm -hmm. But that's the part of like the uh, danger versus reward system that this uh, level-based traveling system uh, uses. Uh, and I kind of like it because it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> if you know that, uh, oh crap, we, have, uh, we haven't navigated really well during these last uh, days, uh, perhaps if they then bump into something that's, uh, you know, a ruin in the far wood that st stands alone, uh, would you explore it or would you just let it go? Uh, because you know that exploring it might lead to something really awesome, but it might also be uh, really deadly. Mm -hmm. um, now, when now when it comes to the other thing that was that I'm very I'm very curious about is um is the is the the combination of the material library and the modular armors because I think both of them are kind of hit are kind of hitting on the same point of the living off the land f feel that you're trying that you're trying to go with yes um and I'm curious how how that's going how that's going to be expressed uh, so uh, it's uh, it's really part. This is all connected. All the different like uh, uh, things that I've added to the book, like the modular armor system and uh, the foraging for materials and the hunting and such. Everything is really based uh, on the thought that while traveling, uh, I want the players to be able to do stuff. To you know, uh, uh, the old way of traveling in a traditional campaign. Is often that the dungeon master uh, gives you a, you know, perhaps a beautiful description of your surroundings and what you're going through, uh, and you have to roll perhaps once or twice of something that the dungeon master says, "Roll this now." Mm -hmm. uh, but what I want this to be is that while you're traveling during the day, it's like, okay, wait, I want to stop now to look for this plant uh, because we need it because we're traveling through marshlands and there are. Uh, something called marsh fever that one of us has uh, gotten and we need to find uh, this plant that can uh, so we can use it during our next long rest you know or we need to hunt for this or uh, I would like to try and find something that I can uh, yeah, create a piece of armor from uh, when we get to our next destination uh, so everything is like based around that so the modular armor system is really based is to use uh, materials that you find to create pieces of armor uh, and uh, the regular armors in fifth edition are you know kind of clunky it's like you have 
<laughs> a big piece of armor and that's it. You know, uh, you have this uh, full plate mail that you buy, uh, or you can buy perhaps a uh, plate mail uh, or some different piece, but you can't buy like only a shoulder guard, or and you have no system for that really. Uh, so the modular armor system is uh, built around the concept that uh, in the world of Lorsun, where metals are extremely rare, uh, only the most uh, legendary wayfarers and leaders of settlements uh, have metallic items. Uh, so uh, in the world of Lorsun, uh, you, many items are crafted through a, a concept called a stone chanting or wood chanting. So that's pretty much low-level magicians uh, that are like blacksmiths uh, that craft items from stone and wood, from living plants. Uh, so a blade might be cre crafted by uh, a stone chanter, uh, you know, writing runes on a stone and uh, singing, you know, a chant for several days until the core of the stone is hardened enough that he can ship out uh, the blade that has been created within. And then uh, a wood chanter might take a plant and uh, form that into a hilt, which also grows to, you know, with its roots uh, enveloping the blade. Uh, and that becomes an item. Uh, so part of this uh, foraging and finding materials is, uh, and the same thing is for armors, that they can make armors this way, and pieces of armors. So you find perhaps some a strange mineral in the firewood that you want to use for your armor because it makes it become uh, bioluminescent or mm -hmm. makes it uh, become uh, uh, able to absorb uh, uh, a low uh, amount of uh, magic or something. Uh, so you use that mineral and a stone chanter will you know, incorporate it into a piece of your armor and then you can add that piece and remove an old piece. And uh, there's a system of how many pieces you can have and how much uh, AC each piece gives you, depending on which type of, uh, you know, material is used, if it's wood or if it's stone, uh, and how d uh, usually how expensive they are, they are and how much they weigh. Uh, so it's much, it's like, okay, you can't get uh, over-encumbered by your uh, armor, and also if you don't have uh, perhaps strength enough, you can't carry too many different armor modules and if you don't have proficiency in heavy armor, you can't use stone armor modules. And yeah, so there's a bit of like, there's a little bit of a system there mm -hmm. set in place to keep it in check so you can't get an infinitely high AC or anything. Uh, no. I think it works kind of well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, and it's, it's having, having a piece based armor ap approach is, is certainly going to be daunting given the fact that there's not written. There's never really been something to support that in um, a framework like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, now if, we, if you had, if if you're dealing with something that's trying to go for a bit more realism, like say Song of Swords, yeah, you'd have you'd have that kind of thing in Spades, but that's not the case. Um, no. Now, and I'd it's like... also I I need to say that it's also uh, this is a optional rule set, so you can go for you know that. Uh, people buy a regular if you buy a plate mail that's uh, just translated into a full set of uh, a stone uh, stone armor you know so that's uh, you can use that approach as well if you feel it's it became if it becomes too much rule wise mm -hmm. um now i'd like to ask a bit on a bit on the player end of things now you've You've mentioned that there, you mentioned on the Kickstarter pages that you're going to be introducing the Spirit Chanter class, as well as, as well as some potential um, subclasses. But yes. I, I want to start with the Chanter. So I can inf I can infer that it's it's probably it's probably a casting class. But is it a is it a full or is it a full or a half caster? First off. Uh, well, I'm not completely sure of the definitions there, but I would say a half caster, I guess. <laughs> so it's a bit of a special uh, thing. Uh, it's more, uh, they don't have spell slots. Uh, so uh, what their, uh, their base uh, ability 
is something called their chant. Mm -hmm. So a spirit chanter can go into a chant, which is a concentration-based ability. And I like the thing that... Uh, so it's a, a constitution and wisdom-based class. So you, your highest score, would want, you would want that to be constitution, really. And then uh, your next highest to be wisdom. Uh, and uh, the reason for it is that it's ma made to be sort of a tank class, uh, but also uh, with the, they can give uh, you know a bit of a utility class. They can be, give uh, your friends uh, benefit like buffs, and uh, your en perhaps uh, lower stats on your enemies and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it goes into its shant, uh, it gains access to uh, some abilities uh, that it can uh, do. Uh, so there are abilities such as, uh, 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 let's see, what's the most easiest one? Uh, so there's uh, an ability called the Enraging Chant, where it can create, it can make uh, uh, enemies uh, enraged and uh, want to attack them instead of other people. Uh, so it becomes sort of like, uh, yeah, a, a tank that wants, to, uh, but there's also this then uh, kind of interesting uh, double the sword mechanic where uh, your chant is concentration based, so each hit you take, you might lose the chant for the time being, and that effect might end then because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I like to play around with uh, those sort of concepts where you know you uh, can do some cool stuff, but you also risk something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the main ability is their chant, which you know they can keep on as long as they keep their chant going, they can keep on like adding more. Uh, uh, if uh, they can use more features on their the people around them, you know, uh, but eventually they might be uh, lose them due to you know rolling bad on a uh, concentration check. Uh, but then there is also that the spirit chanter has uh, is something called a spirit vessel. So this is more like the flavor wise thing about the spirit chanter. So uh, in the farwood uh, or in this. Uh, world, uh, there's uh, something called spirits, which is more or less, uh, it's not souls. I made a clear distinction in this world between spirits and souls. Mm -hmm. So souls are a divine thing, you know, and when you re uh, re uh, <laughs> resurrect someone, it's their soul that you're, you know, working with. Uh, while a spirit is a, a completely uh, arcane thing. So due to the uh, large and raw, mag the, the very... Uh, potent magic of Lorsun, uh, almost all beings have been infused with some magic. And this magic is uh, something that has uh, more or less uh, uh, copied or uh, uh, been flavored by the creature's own abilities and own uh, uh, nature. So when a, nat when a creature uh, falls, uh, you know, is, uh, is slayed or something in this world, uh, that spiritual energy is uh, something that uh, a spirit chanter can bind and use. Mm -hmm. uh, so it becomes a resource, an arcane resource, really. Uh, so uh, a spirit vessel, a, a spirit chanter can then bind spirits to, the sp to their spirit vessel and use these spirits in different ways, depending on the subclass, really. So the spirit yeah. vessel is more, the chant is the main feature. And the spirit vessel is something that's explored in the different subclasses in different ways. I got uh, you. I got you. Hmm? So that's uh, pretty much it. Mm -hmm. um, since you mentioned sub, since you mentioned subclasses, what could what could some of the explorations with those with those be when it comes to the subclasses of um, of the chanter? Uh, so when it comes to the chanter, it, they have three sub. It comes with three subclasses, as any or most uh, or many of the regular classes do. Uh, so uh, it has a spirit hunter a subclass, which is, uh, or they're called spirit philosophies, really, and they're spiritual philosophies. Uh, so the spirit hunter has the philosophy of uh, they want to augment their own strength by uh, binding. Uh, the most powerful spirits to their spirit vessel and use them to become, you know, the uh, uh, prime hunters, really, uh, mm -hmm. the apex predators of uh, the farwood. Uh, so they use, uh, they see uh, spirits as a pure resource for them to uh, become more powerful. Uh, they 
uh, you know, burn the spirits to uh, gain strength, and they, uh, yeah, uh, can almost like a paladin use the spirits to like b give a divine smite, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, while uh, then there's the on the other side of the spectrum, you could say, is the spirit keeper. Uh, and the spirit keeper sees the connection with the spirits as a, a holy bond uh, that they uh, each spirit that they bind uh, is uh, is you know a, a holy act and they uh, might even talk to their spirits and you know uh, ask for their permission to uh, lend the, uh, give aid to their uh, allies and such so that's more like a bit more of a cleric almost that it's uh, some uh, the spirit guardian or spirit keeper has uh, abilities and features that are meant to uh, help allies really mm -hmm. uh, and then there's uh, the last one which is the spirit mancer which uh, uh, uses uh, it sees the power of the spirits and reveres the spirits really but uh, ultimately uh, the uh, spirit mancer uses the spirits to uh, their own gain uh, so they uh, they are the most spellcasty or perhaps even a bit warlocky you could say <laughs> uh, so they uh, use the spirits uh, to create the small familiars uh, that can do tasks for them or they uh, can uh, create weapons from the spirits uh, you know spiritual weapons that uh, burn like ghostly flame and, mm -hmm. you know such things yeah and when it now, I think it was I think it was mentioned that there was that there were some other subclasses that you were that you were um, planning. Um, I know I know a chunk of them are t are tied to stretch goals, but when it comes to those when it comes to those subclasses outside of the ones for the spirit chanter, what can you tell me about what you have um, planned on that end? Yeah, so uh, they are all planned, and they will all be added to the player's guide. Uh, so anyone who's bought the, the whole book or the player's guide PDF uh, will uh, get the subclasses, all the subclasses that are reached, because we have reached all the stretch goals when it comes to all the subclasses. Uh, so what we're working on right now is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, Barbarian Raid Shanter, and that uh, is uh, where we use this shant ability of the Spirit Shanter again, but uh, we use it for a, a barbarian, you could say, and that becomes uh, also a very interesting uh, dynamic there. With you know, uh, so uh, it says in the rules that uh, when a barbarian goes into a rage, they can't <laughs> uh, keep concentration mm -hmm. uh, if they need to cast spells or keep concentration on spells. It says specifically. Uh, so <laughs> we have uh, interpreted that as. Okay, but we can still add a feature which uses concentration while raging, uh, as long as it's not spell-based, you know, or has to do with spells. So that's what we've done, uh, and that becomes, I think, a fun, also a fun, you know, this uh, a fun uh, dilemma of, uh, you know, you need to be a tank on the front lines dealing damage, but also you have these abilities then that are tied to some sort of concentration check. Uh, but otherwise, we're looking at the, the Druid, a circle of woe. And uh, woe, in this case, refers to... Uh, that's the uh, common name that the people of Lorsun have given uh, the elemental plant-based beings that exist in the Farwood that are animated uh, into life by the chaotic terralanches and the chaotic magic of the Farwood. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are sort of an immune system almost in the Farwood that... Uh, is always on the search for intruders uh, and also becomes more powerful uh, as it's a bit of an exp explanation why some encounters become more powerful with uh, when <laughs> when you increase in level uh, because uh, these will become more powerful when they feel that the threat is more powerful yeah uh, so the druid, the circle of woe, is a druid that has a very special connection to these beings and has a small familiar woe of plant elemental based being that they can summon uh, from an early level and which they can then use uh, in different ways uh, to uh, store, uh, even you know, store a spell into it which that thing, uh, which the uh, woe can cast on its own and uh, yeah, a little bit of stuff like that. 
then we have uh, also, I can just mention one or something more, perhaps, uh, that mm -hmm. we have a cleric subclass called Primordial Domain, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, we've tried to, we've looked, there's very, a lot of different domains for clerics, like the nature domain that comes with the regular player's handbook and such. And we're trying to find something that's its own feel. Uh, so uh, we uh, took something out of uh, this world, really, uh, with the Farwood, and mm -hmm. thought, OK, how could a cleric really add to a wayfaring company? And uh, in this case, it comes a, a cleric that has a very strong connection to these uh, primordial raw magics that are uh, co coursing through the world, which also are part of like the, the gods that roam the farwood that roam this world are very tightly connected to this uh, magic that flows through the world and the terror lashes and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, they can tap into this uh, to the magic domain of these uh, uh, elemental gods that roam the world uh, to uh, yeah to gain strength from them in different ways. That's their channel divinity feature really is that they can use the different gods domains uh, to do uh, to gain different uh, gain different uh, benefits uh, but they can also uh, uh, ward off in this case in in this case they can ward off uh, uh, these terror lanches in a much more easy way and keep the rest of the group safe from them mm -hmm. uh, and to not make it too uh, parasitic, perhaps, uh, I don't know, that's a word I've heard used in different game developments, but uh, that it's uh, not too specifically uh, only usable in our game. Uh, we also make sure that these rules uh, are, uh, or these features are worded in a way that they can be used in any game, really. So uh, the terror lanches are one uh, thing that they can ward off, but... In another game, it would be uh, worded as uh, if someone tries to physically move you uh, or magically move you, uh, you can you gain advantage on a saving throw against that sort of an effect. And if you succeed, you may choose uh, any number of creatures up to 60 feet of you that also succeed on it. So it could be a way to, like, you know... If uh, if uh, someone tries to banish you or try to uh, you know teleport away a bunch of uh, your friends or something, then you can keep them in the place where they are, and uh, that mm -hmm. uh, translates to you know the terror lashes or something in uh, our world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, when, now um, th I know that there was that. There was a, that you have a um, section you you're planning when it comes to how the different race and class combinations fit within the within um way with, within the Wayfarer setting of Lord's Zone. Um, were there any were there any um, race races or classes that you that you'd consider might be a might be a little bit trickier to do than others? Uh, most definitely. Uh, so uh, one of the trickiest is the warlock. I feel. Uh, because in this world of Lorsum, I feel it's not very much connected to the rest of the multiverse. If there even, if this even is part of it, you could say. So it becomes a bit strange where most warlocks have a fey being or an inferno or some sort or an elder god or something where they get their uh, powers from. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would be the uh, uh, what would be the, you know, corresponding force on Lorsun? Uh, it doesn't really exist uh, at first. So what we had to do is that we've uh, fitted the warlock in. We've, first of all, we said that warlocks are very, very, very rare on Lorsun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that uh, there are beings from other places on Lorsun, but due to Lorsun's, you know, uh, chaotic magic, uh, teleportation magic is uh, something that no one wants to try out because uh, rolling for uh, teleportation on Lorsun might mean that you uh, spend the rest of your life uh, underground or something, uh, <laughs> which will be a very short while. Uh, so a lot of these like teleportation-based magics and planar teleportation 
uh, might fail or in spectacular ways. Uh, so the thought that uh, we had then is that, okay, so uh, if a being has, uh, tell, uh, for some reason, come to Lorsen, they might be trapped there, more or less. So there, there can be those sort of uh, beings that a warlock might find and gain powers from. Mm -hmm. Say that some infernal being has found a new home of Lorsen, and that becomes, you know, their patron. Uh, but also we have these uh, lesser gods, which are uh, semi-sentient, large, uh, monstrous beings that walk the Farwood, uh, that might be more inclined to bestow a wayfarer with some gifts or uh, their patronage. Uh, but the gods are, you know, quite indifferent, really. So that's more like a cleric... Uh, a connection somehow, you know. Uh, a cleric might find a power from a god and their domain, but uh, a warlock would have to have more of a personal connection somehow, and that would be perhaps these lesser gods mm -hmm. instead. Uh, but that was a tricky one, definitely. Yeah. Now, with now, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the. When I came, when I came to the intro, the introduction of the hunting and foraging skills, um, was there some debate early on about whether or not you'd even add new skills, or was that something that you had settled on fairly quickly? Uh, so the hunting and forage skills are also directly a result from, okay, how can we make traveling more interesting and something that you... Uh, where you can do stuff in each terrain, where, you know, each terrain will... We wanted to add some action, more or less, that uh, uh, wayfarers could do, uh, that, depending on terrain, gave you different, like, options and uh, uh, fun stuff to look for. So, uh, the material library is something that all wayfarers have knowledge of. They, it's part of the player's guide. So you can read up on like, oh, uh, oh, this this would be good for us, or uh, we need this, or uh, perhaps we can find uh, some of this. Uh, but you also need to learn uh, how easy they are to find, and also perhaps uh, how to best use uh, these different materials, uh, or plants, or flowers, or whatever you're searching for, uh, and in which terrain you're most easily or most likely might find them. Uh, that's not, that's not a given. So you only know that these things exist, but not exactly how you best find them. Uh, so uh, that was uh, the foraging mechanic was really part of that thought that okay, uh, we can uh, have a skill check uh, that's based around this, where the DM has the knowledge of how easy something is to find, mm -hmm. and what DC that corresponds to, and what happens if you fail or if you succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that ties into like the danger rating and such. Also, if you're out looking for stuff in the far wood, you might attract uh, woe more easily. These elemental beings, uh, you know. So if you're not successful, it might uh, hurt you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, and it's pretty much the th same thing with hunting. That became like okay. So if you can find materials simply by foraging, well, foraging and hunting goes a bit hand in hand. Uh, so perhaps you can hunt for certain materials as well, that you hunt for a uh, a specific woe creature, perhaps, and that creature's spirit is something that you want to bind to gain some benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's how it's... They're really based on the thought that players uh, should be able to fill out the traveling days with uh, uh, interesting activities if they want to. Uh, but each activity might take time, and it might also uh, risk uh, uh, more dangerous uh, situations. All right, I can I can make sense out of that. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to shift over to the Iron Thieves campaign, which is which, if I'm reading this right, is going is a um, essentially a module great taking players from level one through ten. Um, yeah. Now one of the now one of the big one now um, one one question that I do that I do have uh, that I do have on this kind of thing is when it comes to when it comes to the idea of, of putting in a campaign along with 
along with the um, setting book right out right out of the box. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> For lack of a better term. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's a good question. I need to think a little bit, I think. Um, so, uh, first, because as I said, I found a lot of like the passion for all of this and creating all this out of writing. So I think a lot of ideas of a interesting storyline might have come first, actually. Uh, it's not impossible. Uh, but I think that uh, the actual thought of adding a campaign uh, and, you know, fleshing that out, uh, that came after uh, I had created uh, at least the foundations of this world. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the thought about the, all of this, about the traveling system and such. Uh, but the campaign is really... Uh, why, why I've added it at all is because I feel like if you buy a book like this with a completely new setting and everything... It might be kind of uh, fun and easy for a dungeon master to just open up the campaign, start reading the first chapter and be like, okay, I can start with this. This would be fun. Uh, and, you know, have something to uh, directly kick off a game with uh, without having to, you know, start everything from scra scratch yourself. Uh, so that's where it came from, uh, really. The, the big idea why to add it. Uh, but then there's always been also a little bit of a thought, uh, uh, like a hidden, <laughs> what do you call it? A, um, I say something on the Kickstarter of what I call it, uh, that there is a, uh, let's see if I can find it here. A second. Uh, or there's a small uh, hidden agenda or an ulterior motive, perhaps mm -hmm. even, to uh, the... Uh, to this uh, game or this world and that is uh, I want to engage the players and game masters in exploring perhaps some important concepts uh, that are woven into like the foundations of this book mm -hmm. so uh, important concepts in this case is uh, like uh, do you uh, really need to uh, always slay the monster that is in front of you if you are like walking through the far wood uh, is it a good idea to slay the monster or can you like solve this in another way? Uh, or uh, the civilization on this plane that tries to... Uh, it's really civilization on this plane is uh, much uh, part of the... Uh, of nature in general. But in the campaign, and the campaign antagonist wants to change this in a radical and very, very foundational way. Mm. Uh, and wants to really change the whole... Uh, way that the world uh, world works and this will of course upset the system and the ecosystem and this world's you know balance uh, a lot mm -hmm. and uh, does civilization have the right to do this you know for their own survival and expansion uh, and you can be on uh, either side of that argument so i wanted to create an antagonist that really had you know a clear motivation why she, in this case, uh, wants to do what she wants to do uh, and sees the good in it. Like, the good in a very long-term perspective. Uh, and I think uh, even some players might agree with that. So, so I want like the end scenario, really, uh, to be, if possible, and this is of course totally dependent on each playgroup and how they play and the DM and what sort of game they're running. Uh, but that there is a possibility that it might end up in, I'm actually on the antagonist side of this, <laughs> when they eventually find out like the whole story, <laughs> uh, that that might happen, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like black and white in any way. Yeah. Um, um, and now the other, the other, th the other thing when it comes to that campaign that I'm cu um, curious about is. The nature of contracts, which, given the fact mm -hmm. that you're that you're um, that you're not playing that with this campaign, you're not playing a bunch of murder hobos. You're playing people who are um, literally adventuring for a living. Yeah. Um, I'd like you to go into how the contract system works, and if there if there is means to expand to if there is um framework to expand upon it once so once somebody completes the campaign. Yeah, so uh, a contract in this world is more or less, it's a contract, is what it is. It's, uh, so you, uh, 
uh, a wayfarers are part of a wayfaring company, more or less. So that's a bit of a fun thing. I thought that okay, uh, it, it was also a thought that sometimes when you start a campaign, it might be hard to like identify why this group that's playing together, why they specifically are together, what is their shared goal somehow, mm. and why are they trying to achieve what they're trying to achieve. So I wanted to make that super clear. And in this case, it's like, okay, you have a Wayfaring company together. You might have started it. If you might come from various different backgrounds and have various different, you know, your own agendas and stuff. But you're really, uh, right now, the thing you want to do is make some uh, money and, you know, get some experience and uh, be a bit more known so people are willing to hire you. Mm -hmm. uh, so this... Uh, so that's why contracts exist as well in this world. It's more or less that, okay, you sign a contract with someone to do a certain task. In this case, uh, you need to travel and uh, you might be, uh, you know, carrying their goods or you might be escorting people or uh, something else, uh, you know, just delivering a message mm -hmm. uh, from one place to another. And uh, you, so you sign a contract where you get some, money up front usually and then so you can prepare for your travels and then when you get back you get the full payment uh, and uh, i thought it was kind of a fun thing that okay you have this company that you're actually building up and you uh, create a bigger and bigger you know uh, you become more and more renowned as you complete more and more contracts and harder and harder and longer journeys and then you eventually uh can take on uh, bigger contracts, you know, that are more complex. Uh, and uh, yeah, and depending on what sort of group you are, you might, uh, some might just do certain contracts that they feel like, okay, this is for uh, the good of everyone somehow, <laughs> whilst others are like, okay, we're more okay to do this shady deals or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's, uh, I thought the contracts was a clear way to really give people sort of uh, side quests. Uh, that also are very hard tied to this concept of having a wayfaring company that you're building, really, mm -hmm. uh, and giving you a good reason to, you know, travel from point A to point B and yeah. experiencing uh, the world that way. And when it comes to the, when it comes to the use of use of them, have um, obviously obviously completing contracts adds to funds, but had there been con some consideration for for some sort of ref some sort of reference to renown i.e. the more con the more contracts that you do the easier it is to get to get higher to get ones that are going to have more pay uh well not as at a system level really so there's not like part of a scoring system that you get a certain uh, renown uh, level or something that's uh, a very interesting idea and something that i think might have been in the mix at some point but uh, now it's really much, it's a bit more loose. So it could be like, okay, this contract, it can say on the contract for the DM that, okay, this contract would only be available to the players if they have, uh, you know, completed this and this. Otherwise, the person wouldn't, uh, you know, give them the contract because yeah. they wouldn't be, yeah. And uh, this part of like expanding on contracts, of course, uh, I write it pretty much everywhere in the book. I think that uh, it's always up to like the game master the dungeon master to, yeah, uh, to add anything they like, you know, and uh, skip any parts they don't like. So uh, it, write more contracts. That's just fun. And I have like a few basic. Yeah, I have I, somewhere. Uh, I in some parts of the campaign, I, I might give some ideas like this could be an interesting contract that you could create, or you know, mm -hmm. so small hooks. Yeah, and. When it now, when it comes to the when it comes to the book size overall, what are you shooting for as far as a um, total page count? Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Were you oh, okay? Uh, so, um, uh, 280 pages is the book's length at the moment, but I think that it will become actually a bit longer. So, <laughs> might end up at 300. Espe like especially, get, especially given some some of these subclasses, and I, yeah. I was, I was when it. Hang, hang on a minute. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. When, 
I w because of the fact that a lot of the subclasses were tied to were tied to stretch goals, I was I was avoiding delving too much into them. Um, but but you but with some of them you had you had already um you had already kind of de kind of dealt kind of delved into it in in some regard. I there's a few that I'm a bit um I'm a bit cur I'm a bit curious how they'd how they'd ki how they'd kind of play out. Um, one of them. Because you, because you mentioned um, warlocks being rare, is the is the sorcerer um, sub subclass um, streamweaver. Yeah. Uh, so the streamweaver is more or less uh, the concept there is that a uh, it can also tap into this uh, current of uh, magic the currents of magic that f flow through the weave in this world. To like supercharge their themselves a, a little bit like their meta magic, yeah, you know, uh, abilities. But uh, in this concept, it's more like okay, so it's not completely developed yet, but it's more like that they can uh, link together spells almost uh, at the cost of uh, uh, at the cost uh, that is based on roles mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that can be like a cost of uh, spell slots or even. Uh, cost of uh, their own uh, life, <laughs> so it's uh, it's based on like uh, it's not a completely developed concept yet, uh, but it's uh, that's the major idea is that they somehow you know uh, use uh, these currents of magic to just uh, be able to uh, cast uh, more spells, perhaps at, at a lower you know power or something, but mm -hmm. uh, a bit like their. Uh, Meta magic sometimes allows them to do, uh, but that uh, ability uh, also comes with the risk of burning out somehow. Mm -hmm. Now, when it c the other one that I was uh, that was a bit curious about is the void dance because it it there's cert there's certainly some imagery that can be put in my head as far as as far as what that is, but I'm cu but I'm curious how that how you're inter how you're interpreting that particular approach. Uh, so uh, the void dancer, the idea behind that uh, subclass, is really that it's uh, supposed to be a uh, subclass that it's. Uh, it's on the other side of uh, like this. Uh, this world is so infused by magic. There's so much uh, magic in it that this class is uh, isolated almost uh, from uh, magical uh, from the magic around them. Uh, so they can be uh, a great addition if you want to be like uh, not be able to be seen by magical means or uh, that they are like a void uh, from uh, from magical. Uh, effects uh, so they have certain like advantages when it comes to perhaps saving throws and such but also that they can even use their uh, sword they can uh, to uh, null magical effects or their sword their blade or their weapon whatever uh, choices mm -hmm. uh, by almost hitting uh, a you know attacking a magic that's coming towards them or their friends uh, so the void dancer is meant to be someone who dances in the void, uh, like he, they're not part of, uh, almost not part of the world that's around them. Somehow they are, perhaps also due to this flavor-wise, they might be felt as very strange beings, and you know, it's a, it's not the typical fighter that's just you know a, uh, a bit of a uh, you know brute or something. This is uh, someone who might become that people might feel is. Uh, uh, strange to say the least, or even uh, discomforting, because they don't fit in into the natural world somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, of Lorson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, what would you be? What would you be aiming for as far as a release window for Wayfarers of the Farwood? So our goal is to uh, deliver the books uh, to people in November. So uh, a lot of uh, the book is already completed. Uh, or, you know, there's a lot of finishing uh, touches to be made. There's uh, proofreading, corrections. We have a lot of artwork that's still, uh, you know, being ordered. The world map is being ordered pretty much as we speak. <laughs> uh, and uh, such things. Uh, 
but uh, given, uh, but we hope still to be able to, uh, uh, you know, send it out to the presses kind of soon, <laughs> or what do you call it, uh, to actually create the book, mm -hmm. and uh, and then after that, uh, you know, send it out so it's in people's hand before the end of the year, you know, hopefully in November. All right, and I'll I'll certainly be keeping an eye out on how, on how it develop on how it develops, especially since. I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure I can c I'm pretty sure I can conjure up an entire playlist to work to work with th to work with this kind of setting. Plus, um, my plus my own play my own players kn know that I know that I will fill force with very interesting things because, um, well some well there's a lot of there's a lot of forest where I come where I come from and a lot and. And w everybody at my table is familiar with stories about thing about things in the wilderness that probably want you dead. <laughs> yeah, because and that, a lot of people would look at that and say that I'm making an uh, I'm making an Australia joke. No, I'm no I'm making a joke about every Eastern European forest ever. Yeah, <laughs> you want a you want a, de you want a death trap? Just look just look at those and what and how, and why they show up in every single fairy tale we all grew up with. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Thank you very much to have uh, of, uh, for having me. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>